Um, so we're still working on the existence of God. We'll still have another week next week. Well, no, next week is All Saints, so uh, the week after that we have we'll finish up on the proofs of the existence of God. So today, again, we're working on proofs for the existence of God. And today we're looking at the moral order. Now, what do we mean by moral order? The moral order means that department of the world's activity that's marked with a character of morality. In other words, that something is good or evil or right or wrong. Moral order means <coughs> the free and deliberate um, activity of human uh, of human beings. We we as human beings are have free will and we're free to do something or not do something. So anything that falls in that category is part of the moral order. Um, so because man is free and can make choose to do certain things or avoid certain things, he, he has to be conscious that there is good and evil in the world. He recognizes an order in things. We talked last week about the order and the design. He's, he's bound to conserve that there's, there's certain things that he has to do or that he should do. And there are certain things that he's forbidden to do or that he shouldn't do. He knows this instinctively. Um, so it's not, and all men feel this. All men feel this very clearly. And they know that there are these activities are subject to law. We call it the moral law. Now, there are physical laws in the universe. We talked about that last week when we talked about design. There's physical laws. And those are laws that can't be disobeyed. You can't, you can't, they, they're not subject to choice. The law of gravity. You can't say, oh, I'm not going to obey the law of gravity and float up into the air. It doesn't happen. You can't disobey those laws. You can't disobey the, the, the laws governing, the biological laws governing you, the, the pumping of your heart or how you the breathing or that how plants make energy those are, are are laws that can't there's no choice involved I thought we could have babies now uh, <clears throat> the the act of having a baby is maybe physical law but the choice to have one is would fall into the moral category so this is this is a law that man uh, but and because we're talking about moral laws these are they're not physical laws. They're what we call a natural law. It's the moral law is a law that means that we we understand that we have we ought to obey it, but we're not forced to do so. Unlike physical laws, you can't disobey them. You can disobey the moral law. And here we're referring to man's conscience. His his reason recognizes. And per, that there are things that are good and that are evil. The things that there are things that are right and wrong, and and that's and that so therefore he is aware that there is a moral law. And this is a universal fact. I mean, this is, all men in all times, whether they're savage, comes lived in a savage barbarian civilization or a very civilized one, all men in all times have acknowledged that there are certain things that they should not do. And there are certain things that they should do. And once, once that they, and these things they arrive at once they've reached the, the age of reason or have the use of reason because it's reason that makes them understand this. Before, a baby who has not yet reached the age of reason doesn't understand that there's right and wrong. His parents guide him in that direction. But once he reaches the age of reason, he makes those choices on his own. So among various people throughout time and throughout history, and in all, as I say, in all civilizations, all cultures, 
there, there are various applications of the moral law. But the law itself is everywhere, and it's always the same. And the, basically, it comes down to this. The moral law comes down to this. Do good, avoid evil. Now, the question is, what do you consider good or what do you consider evil? There are certain things that everybody can, that it's imprinted in your heart that you know that it's, that it's, it's, you should do it or you should avoid it. For example, um, even though men have varying opinions about uh, good and evil, and that can be explained because of human weakness, perversity, and because the fall of man, the, it's evidence that man did fall, but and we'll get to that in later. But yet, that the moral idea behind it doesn't vary. No man of any race or tribe has ever believed that murder is is right, or lies, or contempt of parents, that those are all good things. No civilization in history, going back to the most primitive tribe you can think of, has ever believed that. And there's no man throughout all of history who ever thought that loving your parents, being truthful and honest, are evil. Now, again, it's always open into, to different cultures have looked at things differently. So, for example, in ancient Rome, a man might have believed that a, a man might have believed that he had the power, the right of life or death over his children or and his slaves. But that didn't mean that he approved a murder. He just didn't consider the killing of children or his slaves as murder. He, it was interpreted differently. If it was murder, he would have not. He would have said, "No, it's wrong," but they didn't consider it murder to kill a slave. He is my personal property. It's property, not a person. And your child to kill a child because it's deformed or. We do that today. It's called abortion. And our society does not consider it murder. But it is. I mean, we think it, it, it really is. But our society doesn't consider it murder. So this is this is a perverse and mistaken application of the moral law but it's not a failure to recognize that the law itself exists you can't use that as a, a say well it doesn't exist because no it's, it, that roman would not have killed that child or that slave if he it if it was considered murder in his society just as if abortion were outlawed in our society, you would not be allowed to do it. And deep down, basically, the woman who does commit an abortion, she knows, they, she knows yes, it bothers her for the rest of her life. Of her life. So, um, and that's, again, that's your conscience. Because your conscience points those things out to you. Moral law imposes itself on your consciousness, and a man feels this obligation even if he doesn't obey the action, and that's why there's guilt. He feels it even if he doesn't obey it. So where does this law come from? Did man make the law for himself? For if... For it forbids what he wants to do and commands what he wants what he wants to avoid. So man could not have been the author of this moral law. He didn't invent it for himself. Each of you did not invent the moral law for yourselves. It was something you it came to you once you reached the age of reason. You didn't invent it because otherwise you there would be no guilt in the world if you're the one who decides what's moral and what's not moral. Secondly, the moral law uh, can't be explained as an outgrowth of custom among men. 
because again, it's always been there. Custom changes with and but the moral law has doesn't change. Murder in the beginning was always murder. Cain and Abel. It was always murder. It and it's still murder. Re, reason revolts against the idea of murder being a virtuous act. There's no way you can ever be it. No sane human being would ever look at murder and say, oh, that's great. Or, or you know, that people steal. Somebody takes your property. Oh, that's great. No, you would be, in, you know, you'd be ready for the, they lock you up. Third, it can't be the result of human legislation. You know, people got together and made it a law. Because the moral law... Um, if it was made by humans, could be, again, changed or abrogated. And new laws could be passed. But again, the moral law hasn't changed. And it's, it's the human mind would never even consider allowing murder to be permissible or the stealing of your property is permissible. So if man didn't make the law, if custom and legislation didn't make it, where did the law come from? So the moral law is a true law. So it must of necessity have come from a lawgiver, someone who had the power to make the law and the intelligence to design it, to frame it as a moral law, the right and the power to impose it and the wisdom to enforce it. So there's only one person that meets that criteria and that is God. So the legislator, the lawgiver, we call God. Again, the supreme legislator and the first cause of the world have to be one and the same thing. For the le if the legislator were different than the one, the first cause, the one who started everything, then the legislator would be an effect because the cause started it. He that would be an effect, and um, the power and the right of intelligence. All of that has to come from the first cause because only the first cause would have that power. Furthermore, since the first cause is supremely intelligent and powerful, and we've already proved, proved that, we, we and it, that he had a plan and design, which we saw last week, that he willed to have it have carried out. It's also obvious that that first cause, and because of that plan, and for the attainment of the purpose, the end for which he designed human beings, that such a course, in order to take force, um, could not it would it would take the force of a form of coercion for non-living things. But it would have he they would have to be free if they were living beings. In other words, non-living things like animals or or think, living things that do not have reason reason or like animals god gives them instinct to tell them what they need to do and what they shouldn't do but human beings he gave intelligence and though therefore for us it's he also had to give us the freedom to make a choice so the form of law for creatures means that it's under our control whether we choose to do it or not to do it it's not like the physical laws that you can can can't disobey it. He gives he gives us because he made us free. He gives us the choice to do or not do the this the moral law, which ultimately ended up in the fall, which again we'll get to later. So, the argument comes down to this again the the syllogism. There exists in the consciousness of all man men the inevitable knowledge of a universal law. 
that's changeless and absolute. We'll get to the absolute in a minute. Which requires free will, although it doesn't compel or force it, to either to do good or to avoid evil. That all men have a, within us a consciousness that we need to do something or avoid something. We need to do good things and we need to avoid bad things. Now, second premise, such a law presupposes the existence of a lawgiver because where did that law come from? If it's imprinted in our heart, part of our moral being, our consciousness had to come from outside of us. It has, so it has to be distinct from us and superior to us in nature and will. And, there, and, and also, therefore, identified with the first cause, which is God. So, therefore, God exists. If those two are both true, and we've shown that they're both true, then God exists. The very fact that there is a moral law proves the existence of God. So, discussion of the argument. As soon as man reaches the age of reason, when he's able to decide things for himself, he also begins to recognize that certain things are good and others are evil. Not all things, but certain things. And there, he, he clearly is, knows these things are good in themselves and therefore they should be done. And that other things are clearly bad in themselves and should be avoided. Coming to the use of reason is not a sudden recognition of these things. It's not instantaneous. Oh, I've reached the age, I, on my seventh birthday, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I usually, that's we around six or seven, they say you reach the age of reason. That means you can tell good from bad. That's how we decide when you've reached the age of reason. You know what's good and what is bad. Um, but it's, it doesn't happen instantaneously overnight on your birthday. It comes upon you gradually. Uh, and as time goes by, you will understand that certain other things are, you'll, that list of things that are to be avoided gets longer and the list of things to do gets longer because you mature and you live in the world and you begin to see things outside of your home that you know you should avoid or would like to pursue. But it all, it's, it, this clarifying of knowledge is part of life and experience, and it continues to increase as you get older. But the moral law itself, which is in its basis, do good, avoid evil, that moral law itself is known from the moment when a person becomes responsible for their own conduct. When you reach that point in your age where you understand that there are things that are good and there are things that are evil. This requirement of, of rational nature, hence the moral law, is universal and recognized by all men in all times. Further, the moral law is changeless and also absolute. Absolute means unconditional. Conscience doesn't say, do good if you want to, or avoid evil if, it's you, if it pleases you. Conscience simply says, do good and avoid evil. It's absolute. There's no gray area. Uh, with reference to humans' likes and pleasures. There is no condition, no qualifier attached to the mandates of doing good and avoiding evil. The second premise follows as an, as an effect of the first. If there is a law, then there has to be a lawgiver who is distinct from the man himself. Other wise man could change the moral law and free himself from its obligations and the guilt. This lawgiver has to be superior to man's nature and, and will man and will because man is constrained to recognize himself as the subject of the law. 
In other words, it has to, the, the, the lawgiver has to be above man in order to constrain man to obey it. And um, so the, the, the lawgiver has to be distinct from human beings, not a human being. So this, in summary, here we've discussed that there exists a moral order which classifies man's acts as good and evil. And this moral law demands the performance of good acts and forbids evil acts. And all men are forced by their rational nature, by their intelligence, to admit both that the moral law exists and that they are subject to it. Man cannot deny that there is a moral law, that, that murder is an evil, that um, stealing is wrong, that lying is wrong. They can't, they can't deny that and that they are subject to it. Oh, I'm the exception. I'm allowed to kill anybody I want. Sorry. No. Then who made you the exception? Since men are subject to this law, it must come from a superhuman source the original lawgiver, who is God himself, the first cause, independent and superior to man's will. He's not subject to man's will. Man's will is subject to his will because he is the supreme lawgiver. Any questions? Yes. All right. Again, in the we have we have a rule of law in this country, and you if you murder somebody, you you break certain, you can in turn be killed because we pass the law. You you're you're a you're a detriment to society. You're a and therefore your life is forfeit if for certain for certain things. Again, we don't consider that murder. That's called capital punishment. It's punishment for a crime. And in the case of and no presidents are not above the law and they're not allowed to uh, send assassins out to kill people. That would be going above the law. They may justify it in their own minds as saying um, the, the end justifies the means. In other words, that's the same what they did with our Lord. No, it's better that we kill one man that the, and that the nation not perish. That's what the, the, the Pharisees said it, when they want, were going to send Judas to betray our Lord. It's better that one man perish than that the whole nation perish. And so presidents and other people have that idea. Well, it's better that we, in order for the sake of the country, that we kill this one person. That there, again, the pre, that, per, that person, that president, that whatever, whoever in, the, in authority, they're not looking upon it as murder. They're looking upon it as justified, that it's justified that they are justified. Just like the Roman thought it was fine to kill the, 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 the servant or the child, the unwanted child. It's, 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 uh, there's a reason, and it's, they don't look at it as murder. If they looked at it as murder, then, of course, it's, it's, it's definitely wrong. And I'm not saying that what they're doing is not wrong. And in... in it can be looked at as murder, and we commit moral sins all the time. We know what's wrong, and we go and we do it anyway. It's called mortal sin. It's against the moral law, but we do it. The girl who gets the abortion and knows that it's morally wrong. The man who, who murders or steals. The boy who shoplifts. The guy who makes a, 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 
an arrangement and is lying to you, you know, oh, this car is really, this is a brand new car. It's only got, you know, 10,000 miles on it. Never mind that I turned the, the odometer back, you know, it really has 100,000 miles. It only shows 10. Uh, that's lying. That's cheating. It's wrong. But we do often do what's wrong. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make that person right. And most of the time when we do something wrong, we do try and justify it to ourselves. But it doesn't, but deep down we still know that it's wrong. And that's the moral law kicking in there saying, yeah, you're, you're sending assassins after this guy or you're turning the odometer back. You know that that's wrong. Uh, but yeah, but I need the money. I have to send my kid to college. Or the country, you know, it's, it's for the betterment of the country. Or I can't support this baby right now. You know, being a, a single parent, I can't, I can't deal with that. We always try to justify it. That doesn't change the moral law. And deep down we know that we're wrong. We do the wrong things every day. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, all right. I would say, okay, so next week we're going to look at the last of the uh, uh, proofs of the existence of God, and that is history, and how history shows us that God exists. Um, so, I do have a question. Sure. So what's the distinction about the conviction of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit tells you it's wrong, and the innate in our genes that just tells us this is wrong? What is there a a subtlety there or a distinction? Uh, worth I don't. Discussing? I don't know what you mean by the Holy Spirit tells you. Does He come down, actually tell there you? There may be some other religious uh, religions. It might. It might be. Holy Spirit. It might be. Um, right but we, again, we know what's right and wrong, and you could say that that is the Holy Spirit Before because, again, Spirit, because right. that is God in our conscience. Our our conscience is formed by God. Until, until we start to reform it, we often change our own conscience. And you will be judged, again, I told this in another religion class a long time ago. God will judge you, as Bishop, Arch, uh, Bishop Sheen said, God will judge you on the conscience that he gave you, not the one that you made for yourself. Over, you know, the guy who sets back the, the, the odometer and, she, and steals, and um, he's he, he no longer looking at it as stealing. In his own mind, he feels he's justified in doing this. He's reforming his conscience so that after a while, he doesn't feel guilty doing that. He's cheated so many people, he's, it's, his conscience is no longer talking to him, at least in that area. Maybe if he would commit a murder, that it might it might say, hey, you don't really want to do this. But as far as cheating and stealing, no, he's already, people who lie and get, get in the habit of lying, uh, and no, after a while, they don't even realize, they think about it, they realize it, but they don't think about the lying. Um, you're, you, you can silence that voice of conscience. And... But really, but the, the, the conscience that God gave you, it's still there. You've just kind of cut off connection to certain parts of it where you won't listen anymore. You know, like, like you get used to background noises. You know, if you live on a busy street after a while, you don't hear the traffic. You know, you have a neighbor constantly playing the piano or screaming at his, you know, the husband and wife's constantly screaming at each other. After a while, you don't even hear it. You can cut those noises out. You can do that with your conscience, too. Your conscience telling you things are wrong, and after a while, you, 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 you ignore it long enough, you won't hear it. It's still telling you, but you won't hear it until you, you, you begin to listen to it again. So you have to be very careful of that, that when your conscience tells you something, you listen. You don't ignore it. You don't want to become so desensitized to it because that you will that then venial sin becomes very easy and mortal sin is just a step away until mortal sin becomes very easy. If you you desensitize yourself to the voice of your conscience. 
Uh, but yes, your as far as that goes, the, your conscience, whether that's the voice, that is the voice of God in speaking in you. It's it's the voice that you put inside you to to guide you to knowing what's right or wrong. You can call it the Holy Spirit. You could call it something else, but it's basically the same thing. Now, when, if the Holy Spirit comes and speaks to you, for you know, you know, an actual voice, you know, that or that that's something else entirely. I would imagine, but it's never happened to me, so I can't tell you. The Holy Ghost is never, you know, in a voice that I could hear. He's 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 instructed me in many ways in many different forms, but never, never in that kind of voice. My mother, my my mom, yes, but me, no, no. Yes, in a way, but intuition is not exactly the same as conscience. Intuition is you have a feeling about something, not feeling about good or evil, feeling that you should do something or not do something that is not necessarily evil. You know, I, I, I shouldn't go. I don't think it's a good idea letting my kids go here. I, I have feeling something bad, something's going to happen. Uh, that's intuition. Uh, that's and it has. It's not based on a moral moral thing that the kid is going to some place that's bad. You just feel that there might be a car accident or something. You know, this kid can't be trusted. It, often we have a feeling about a person that we can't trust them. And that's intuition. Mothers have their own intuition about kids, and that's it's it's a valid intuition. You should listen to it. Kids often don't understand that when mom's, mom won't let me go, and I don't understand. Because your mother had a feeling that this friend is not the best friend for you. And you have no problems with them, but your mother, who has lived much longer and has more maturity, sees something in them and or, or just feels that there's something off about this kid, that maybe you shouldn't be playing with them. And that's, again, that's not right or wrong. It's not a moral issue. That's intuition. And this is different. That's why they call the Holy Spirit to speak to you. That's where it's called. Oh, okay. Like it, like okay. Like yeah. We could look, you could look at it that way. It's your guardian angel guiding you into doing, do, you know. And again, your guardian angel also works with your conscience pointing out to you, maybe yelling. You're not listening to the conscience voice, so the angel yells a little louder, you know, it's that sort of thing. Um, but also, you're, And that's part of your angel's job is is your angel's job to help get you into heaven, but also to help protect you on earth, to guide you away from situations that may be detrimental to your soul, but also to your body. But... That's that's a different issue, and that's not part of uh, this part of apologetics. So, yeah, we can talk about angels a whole class some other time. Yeah, it's a whole lot to talk about with angels. No. All right, no other questions. So it's difficult to have that position to be a president like that. Yes. Yes. And you, I mean, as as the old the, the the maxim says, or as our Lord said, to whom much has been given, of them much will be required. So the the higher the position you have, you will someday that president will have to stand before Almighty God and face all of those decisions that he made, for good or for evil. And that's why, again, in the realm of angels, they have. They have help of more angels than normal people. There's an angel for every country, and they can call upon the help of that angel, the angel for each country, to help them in, in those positions. It's not their guardian angel. They have their guardian angel, but they can also have the help of the angel for the country. There's angels for each church. There's angels for each nation. There's angels for... Um, each religious community, there's there's all different grades of angels that have different jobs, and again, that's a whole different thing. Is the whole angel thing? We'll have to get into sometime. <laughs>